I think, important to, to make it. But I think I found the final point I wanted to make um, was something that Richard noted about um, in the olden days, apparently people used to come up to the curate and give their names if they wanted to receive communion. I'm really glad that's not the case anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a lot of responsibility and not one that I want to take on. But it, it, was, it did raise a question about privacy, uh, which I think is a debate that's going on both in the church uh, regarding um, worship and in the wider society regarding our online lives. Um, how do we uh, keep our data private? Do we want to keep our data private? I think um, we've reckoned with the damaging effects of social media using our data carelessly in the past few years. Um, but also, I've seen a difference in the way I used to use social networking back in the uh, young days in 2009, when I first got Facebook, uh, you know, posting pictures of uh, nights out as a teenager, to kind of quite intentional brand management as a professional person with an online presence. So what are our responsibilities to our congregations and to our brothers and sisters in Christ who may not want to share their worship with Mark Zuckerberg? Um, but then again, the act of increasing privacy by requiring passwords or sending links to, like you say, broadcast or narrowcast, the choice between these two, um, you know, increasing privacy might reduce inclusion. So what do we do about that? There's this huge question still remaining, and I think Richard really uh, engages with these uh, without necessarily giving us <laughs> the straight answer. We've got to keep thinking, haven't we? <laughs> Um, and I think it's a really complex discussion which has strong feelings on either side. I think it's something we'll have to continue to engage with and hold in prayer for as long as online services continue, which may well be forever. Now the cat is out of the bag. So thank you again, Richard, for this timely book and for the opportunity to read and respond to the ideas it presents. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Could you spotlight Gordon for us? I have to say that I speak as um, somebody, I've been part of this group pretty much from its beginning. Um, so what I have to say is, is partly testimony as well as um, a personal reflection. Um, and I'm also, uh, I apologize to those of you who are liturgical geeks, um, but I'm a priest who isn't a liturgical geek. Um, and um, the uh, fine history of liturgical development is something that I rather survived when I was in theological college um, than rejoiced in. Um, nevertheless, as a priest who's presided at Eucharist for uh, getting on nearly for 50 years now, um, I'm very glad that there are people who do do the detail. And I'm glad that there are people like Richard who've taken the trouble and can take the trouble to do the detail as clearly and as meticulously as he has in the book. I want to uh, call to mind uh, one of my heroes of the faith from the 1960s, Archbishop Michael Ramsey. He gave a great caution uh, for people who are doing theology. He was asked by somebody who was no theologian uh, uh, what he'd learned about God in the whole of his ministry and his, his life with Christ. And he said this, God is like the soap in the bath. You grasp him and he's gone. <laughs> and there's a great caution uh, theologically, I believe, because there's so much for me anyway, in the discussion about the validity or otherwise of Eucharistic celebrations that speak of trying to put God in our place where we can somehow um, be sure that he's there. And I'm not totally sure that God is happy uh, playing our games, especially our games of close definition. It seems to me clear that since the Acts of the Apostles, the church has 
continually been trying to play catch up in relation to the work of the Holy Spirit in the world. And I think we're in that situation now uh, as we try to interpret what the Holy Spirit is saying to us through our experience of the pandemic. Uh, in fact, I think our experience of the pandemic, pandemic asks us a series of questions that are of huge importance. Um, the Eucharist is one of them, uh, but social justice across the world is another. So I think we have to be cautious and uh, humble, if I may say so, I'm not naturally a humble person, um, in, uh, in, as, as we look at the issue of Eucharist. For example, I suppose one of the things that used to turn me off um, as a theological, as an ordinant, as a theological student, was the, what seemed to me to be interminable discussions of how the real presence of Christ in the Eucharistic elements could be constituted and conceived. Um, it seemed to me then, and it still seems to me, an absolutely reductionist approach to what we mean by Eucharist at all. I think that for me, the theology of Eucharist has been essentially a theology of connection. And I think Richard's book shows this. It's a theology of connection to the character of God who is love. The theology of connection to the character of God whose love is revealed in mercy. It's a theology of connection to God whose love is revealed in mercy that shows itself in righteousness and truth coming together in intimate embrace. Primarily, I speak as a participant and witness. We found ourselves in this group um, called together as a Eucharistic community. In this Eucharistic community, I have experienced a deep sense of connection with brothers and sisters across the nations across denominations. Yes, I think we have sailed very close to the wind, but I hope that at our best we've sailed close to the wind of the Holy Spirit. And we've met together, we have shared in gathering together, we've shared in penitence and adoration, we've shared in the word read and honoured and spoken. We've shared in reconciliation. We've shared in sacrament and been strengthened by it. And all of this in the middle of our everyday life, Wednesdays at noon. I'm sure that the advantage of uh, the internet and of Zoom is that the service time is inconvenient for absolutely everybody in every part of the world at the same time. Um, it's in the middle of our everyday life that God's glory comes to us and is revealed. I have to say that as Richard was beginning to develop this book, I thought to myself, well, if it pleases him, let him get on with it. Um, uh, it seemed to me uh, a, a crazy project. Um, but nevertheless, as it's developed from seminar papers relating to the discussions of the House of Bishops, to uh, reflections in church leaders, church leaders in the USA, I have to admit that I've occasionally thought uh, that far from venturing into some sort of foolishness, that it was teetering on the edge of some sort of wisdom. <laughs> the truth of the matter is that there are times of real testing, uh, times when, um, I can't read my own writing, this is uh, one of those times, um, that uh, I think there are, there are times when God calls us to really kind of be humble enough to face some of the really hard questions that we might be playing a game that the Holy Spirit isn't comfortable with the rules of. 
I think that uh, we have to be aware that um, uh, the, the uh, connections that, uh, that the Holy Spirit is making are connections that the church hasn't yet begun to be comfortable with. Finally, as a priest, I have always sensed that there is in reality only one totally valid Eucharist. And that is the Eucharist of the Messianic banquet, hosted by God as God's self. That each one of our local celebrations of Holy Communion is our participation in that one Eucharist uh, with Christ himself. I think that what we've been doing in our little group has been We've been envisioning just a little bit of that. And I think Richard's book, Richard, I find, um, I guess everybody here who knows him finds Richard a combination of absolutely maddening and inspiring. Maddening and inspiring. And I guess that that's what this book might do, is it might irritate and inspire enough to take the vital theological reflection forward. And I've got good news for you all. That's all I've got to say. Thanks. <laughs> thank, thank you, Gordon. Thank you, everyone. We've trust us enough on everybody's time. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you to be able to hear all of that. Um, for those of us here, there are drinks and there are lots of books for sale, including a number of books that I got in for the study day I gave for uh, Bishop Christopher. And um, I know that uh, Peter wants to grab a book from the bookstore, which Mike's going to as we, as we go. And to those online, a number of people have said that they've been ordering books um, and will be able to uh, I'll be sending those out. Uh, it has just occurred to me um, and we've lost the publishers, but I'm wondering whether we might try and see if we can get something into the into general synod uh, for the revisions to talk about. Um, I am wondering whether Bishop Michael Itgray, who is the one who's going to be maddened and irritated by the, the, the church time, and going to have to deal with it. If Michael, if there's anything you want to say uh, in, in closing, but what I'm going to suggest after that is that uh, those of us who are in this room and there are drinks and books down at that end. Those of you that are in Zoom can talk to one another. And it may also be possible for some of us here to come up and talk to those of you on screen if you wish to do so. And we'll have about half an hour of being able to do that. But Michael, um, I want to say a huge thank you to you for asking me to write that initial essay, for uh, your reactions in, in emails and for your permission to quote from those and for your pushing of me um, to try to, to explore this. And uh, I, I know I'm maddening, but I'm also offering this, I think, as a contribution to the church for that theological reflection we keep forward. Thank you, Richard. I, I didn't know what was going to come as the end product when I first asked you to write that paper, um, but I'm not entirely surprised. I haven't yet read the Church Times, I look forward to that. And uh, I think I endorse what, what everybody has said, that this, this is an important issue. And I think this book will be a great resource to stimulate and provoke people to discuss it. So thank you. And thank you for make, letting me join us online. And greetings to Southwark Cathedral and, <laughs> and to Andrew on his, on his anniversary particularly. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, one. Thank you very much, one and all. Uh, that concludes the formal bit, but it does conclude the continuing of fellowship uh, in the in the online world and in the uh, physical world.